Hello everyone, my name is Maya Buitelaar. I'm an anthropologist and professor of contemporary Islam at the faculty. And I have the honor of giving you a small sample lecture of how at our faculty in the Bachelor we approach religion. And very often religion is not the explanation of what we see in society, but something that needs to be explained. Why do people practice the kind of religious practices that they do? How come they give certain meanings to what they do? And I'm going to illustrate you how we analyze these phenomena by giving you a lecture on Muslim youth culture, which is part of a wider series of anthropology of Muslim societies that I give in The Bachelor. So let's have a look at this phenomenon. What do we see? Many more girls than before have taken to wear a headscarf, often against the advice of their parents who fear that they might not get an internship or a job later on. But they attach much meaning to wearing a headscarf, to showing and to feeling by wearing a headscarf that they are Muslims. Also, we see that many more youth than before <clears throat> visit the mosque for the Friday sermon or go there to do their prayers. And third, one that I particularly like, is that Muslim youth also develop their own musical style. So here we have the example of the hip hop hijabis, and I recommend you to check them out. They're very cool hip hop duo singers, um, but what they sing is about Islam. So there is a Muslim youth uh, musical style that is being developed. So how are we to understand this phenomenon? Well, first of, cor of course, we can look at religion itself. Three very important authoritative texts in Islam are the Qur'an, which Muslims take to be the literal word of God as revealed to the Prophet Muhammad. And then there is a book which contains many stories about the sayings and, and, and the behavior of the Prophet, Prophet Muhammad himself. And then there's the fiqh, which is a book of jurisprudence in which you find all kinds of regulations that people have developed on the basis of these stories about the Prophet Muhammad and what you find in the Quran. Well, I can tell you that in these books you will find nothing about a specific youth cohort uh, like adolescents, which might explain the development of Muslim youth cultures. But there's more. We can also look at Islamic rituals. And I think I found two that can be seen as rites of passage from one phase of life to another. The first is the circumcision ritual for young boys, and the second are wedding ceremonies. But the circumcision ritual, although it is important, although it introduces boys to, uh, to the Muslim community, become full members of the Muslim community, it doesn't demand a change of behavior. So it doesn't mark a transition from one life phase to the other. Wedding ceremonies definitely do. It marks the end of a careless and responsibility-less youth and the taking on of responsibilities for your own family and for the broader society. But that is really at the end of adolescence, so it's not related to this teenage years that we are concerned with when uh, analyzing Muslim youth cultures. So as an anthropologist of religion, I naturally also look at theories in anthropology. And a very important one that might explain Muslim youth culture in the Netherlands is the acculturation theory, because this is what Muslim youth are preoccupied with. They are finding their own place in that society, not by discarding the culture of heritage, but by trying to interweave it, to merge the culture of origin with the culture in the Netherlands that they grow up with. The girl to the right, for example, is wearing a headscarf that's saying, look, I'm Frisian and I'm Muslim, and I'm both at the same time, and they go together very well. The boy in the middle is standing before a plateau where we see how a Moroccan kickboxer is being inscribed in Dutch history together with other uh, important figures in Dutch history. So they are contributing to the story of who we are as the Dutch people. And 
for many Muslims, it can be very satisfying to find in supermarkets that you are not ignored, that you're not glossed over, but that your religion has become part of that society. For example, by, uh, during Ramadan, when you can find uh, sweets and other foodstuffs that people like to eat in very Dutch supermarkets like Albert Heijn. So what is acculturation? First of all, it is a process of positioning yourself in relation to the parental context, so where you're coming from, the culture of heritage. And on the other hand, it is positioning yourself in relation to the, in this, uh, in this case, the Dutch context, the culture of residence, where you also are a part of. And it's the idea that you try to interweave them, to merge them so that they feel as both an, an integrated belonging to who you are and where you are. Um, when we look at positioning yourself in relation to the parental context, what we often see is that Muslim youth, they not only have learned to critically retext themselves, but they also educate their parents. So having learned in school to critically read text and find their own position, they now also start rereading the Quran and, and, and finding new things that the Imam in, in the village uh, mosque never told their parents who were relying on the Imam because they couldn't read themselves or they had very little formal education. So whereas a mom might say, well, you know, we just stayed at home and we brought up the kids, the daughter might now say, yes, but I want a good education and I want a job. And then if the mother said, yeah, but that, that's not what we do, then she might say, ha ha, remember the first wife of the Prophet Muhammad, Khadija? She was a rich and very important tradeswoman. Khadija actually asked the Prophet Muhammad for marriage rather than the other way around. So these girls, they can educate their parents about Islam, telling them, giving them new information that they never heard from the Imam. But acculturation is also positioning yourself in relation to the Dutch context. And in this sense, this hijab, this wearing a headscarf, you can compare it to the history of the, of the big Afro, of Afro-Americans in the United States. They started wearing these big Afros in the 1960s, saying, hey, we've got our own standards of beauty. We no longer have to abide with the idea that you should be blonde and that you should have straight hair. We won't iron out our hair any longer. We've got very curly hair and look how big it can get. So they actually occupy space demonstrating I'm black and I'm proud. And in the same sense, you can see that Muslim youth, uh, Muslim girls wearing their headscarf are saying, look, I'm Dutch and I'm Muslim and I'm proud. I have the right to participate and exist as a Dutch Muslim. So I'm Muslim and I'm proud. But there's more to the story. If you closely look, these are not just Muslim adolescents. They are adolescents as such. We don't have to necessarily only look at religion, but also at other dimensions of these Muslim youth lives. And then adolescence is a very important phase in the development of identity. So it does make sense not only to take an anthropological point of view, but also a psychological point of view. What is happening in adolescence? Well, Youth face a very important developmental task in adolescence. It is the phase in which they start exploring their own position in society. And this is a process of detachment. So whatever you have been taught and taken for granted and did not consider, you start questioning that and you start reconsidering, is this really for me? And then you reappropriate that heritage and you, uh, uh, you mix it with other new dimensions that you have learned. So this is something that happens in adolescence for everyone, whatever cultural or religious background you have. Um, and this process of detachment and reappropriation has two dimensions. The first is agency, and the second one pertains to identity. Let's first look at agency. Agency is the idea that you feel that it matters to society that you exist. It is the experience that you can exert influence on others and on your environment, that you have power uh, to, 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 to acquire things, to realize things. And it's also the ambition to realize big ideals that make the world a better place to live in. 
it is often particularly youth. For example, now we have in the uh, uh, climate change movement, it is youth who stand up and say, this is our future. You must listen to us and help us change the world. In terms of identity, adolescence is the phase in which you uh, experiment with how do I matter in the eyes of others? From whom do I get recognition? How do I get recognition for whom I really am? And this is both in terms of your own specificity, your own authenticity, but it's also in terms of who do I belong to? Where do I belong? Who do I identify with? And do I get recognition for identifying as belonging to you? So to recap what I said so far about adolescence, adolescence in general is the face of experimentation with your own sense of agency and your own sense of identity and you do that by means of exploring exploring different patterns of behavior and the format in which this often is being done is developing or participating in a kind of youth culture so now we are much closer to understanding, okay, if we understand why youth culture as such plays a role, we can also maybe understand Muslim youth culture. Two important dimensions of youth culture are developing a culture of resistance against the establishment, on the one hand, and on the other hand, developing a culture of specific youth lifestyle. And both dimensions can be recognized in different kinds of Muslim youth cultures that we see in the Netherlands. For example, the culture of resistance against the establishment we can see very easily in the kind of street culture that boisterous boys develop and, and, and you know, feel proud and feel empowered by people who are scared of them, who walk away when they see them in the shopping mall and so on. That is both a culture of resistance against the dominant uh, a culture and population and it is a sense of empowerment you feel strong and you know you are one of the guys so that also gives you a sense of identity and belonging another example is uh, girls who take wearing a, a covering their bodies to a very great extent very radical uh, covering up um, to protest against a culture in which women's bodies must be exposed and in which women become sex symbols. So going there to a great extent of expressing your own identity that you, you matter as a woman and not because of your body, but because of who you are. And of course, this is then a mirror image of other youth cultures, which say, you know, we should be able to expose our bodies without being uh, uh, judged on what we wear, but on who we are. And there's other dimensions that you can recognize as well. Dress codes, for example. Dress codes are very important in youth culture, and you find that in Muslim youth culture itself. If you look very closely, you'll see that over the years, how you wear a hijab, what kind of patterns you wear on your hijab, what colors you wear, that all changes. There is a fashion in wearing hijabs. So dress code can be very important. Uh, same goes for the guy wearing this t-shirt saying Umma, and Umma is the Arabic word for the Muslim community. He is expressing his Muslim self, and at the same time, he's also saying that he belongs to a larger community, and he may be an activist to, uh, to, for, for the benefit of this wider community. And w whether are people part of an organization for the Umma or very local spontaneous acts, you often see that Muslim youth uh, organize events to collect money if there has been an earthquake somewhere, or they organize a, a, a dinner party in, in the mosque where everybody living in that quarter is invited so that they can see we may be different in religion, but there's so much that we share. And of course, music styles is very important in uh, youth culture. And the same goes for Muslim youth cultures. I already mentioned the hip hop hijabs. And here you see an example of Sami Youssef, who is a very popular romantic singer. Uh, but he sings about Islam, his longing to go to Mecca and so on and so forth. Um, so, so far we see many comparisons, many commonalities between different kinds of youth culture, but there might be something that is specific for Muslim youth. 
and that is that they face obstacles either specific obstacles that they face because they have a uh, uh, um, they, they have an other cultural heritage or the obstacles that they face are obstacles that everybody faces but they're bigger for them in terms of agency you can find this uh, in, 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 in the exclusion that many Muslim youth experience because of people's presuppositions about Islam and about Muslims. So they feel excluded. It's diff more difficult for them to get an internship. It's more difficult to get a job. And when they grow up, they'll find it's more difficult to, uh, uh, to get a mortgage or a house. So in terms of agency, in that very phase where you're exploring your agency, they feel it is thwarted it is hampered, they experience exclusion. And in terms of identity, feel, you know, finding out where do I belong, what kind of identities are part of me, they are on the one hand uh, uh, um, confronted with Islamophobia, you do not belong to us, as a Muslim you are different, we Dutch are different from you Muslims, so they're not recognized as being Dutch Muslims. And on the other hand, they also have this sense of estrangement from their parental milieu. They, they often uh, uh, enjoy the culture of heritage, but they wouldn't be able to live in that culture in the same way that their parents would. So there is this kind of alienation. So in terms of agency and identity, Muslim youth have to work harder, you could say, than many other categories of uh, youth in the Netherlands. And this is how radical movements like IS or Al-Qaeda can have an enormous appeal on Muslim youth. Because where in terms of agency they feel thwarted, and where in terms of identity they feel excluded, what these groups promise is an instantaneous empowerment and engagement. You join us and we're a strong movement and people are scared of us and we get things done. And it is enormous engagement. You give up everything to create a better world for Muslims to live in. And in terms, times of, in terms of identity work, IS offers Muslim youth a very specific and detailed script and a sense of instant belongings. We tell you how to dress. We tell you what to eat. We tell you how to speak and so on and so forth. So your identity, identity is already made um, and you belong to us, you have a very strong connection with those of the group. Well, at least this is the appeal. Of course, what happens in practice is a different story altogether, but the appeal that uh, movements like IS can make on Muslim youth and is, is very much based on these answers that they have to existential questions concerning agency and identity work. So let's recap. If from a religious studies point of view, we want to understand the phenomenon of Muslim youth culture, what do we do? Well, of course, we look at religion. That's part of our business. So we look at the authoritative texts and we look at the rituals. And in this case, we found that there is nothing specifically there that uh, concerns a age cohort uh, to, that relates to teenage years. And then coming, looking from a more anthropological lens, we can ex understand Muslim youth culture by looking at it as a acculturation process, a process in which people are positioning themselves in relation to the parental context and positioning themselves in relation to the Dutch context. So here, Islam is uh, appropriate in ways that helps them positioning themselves in relation to these contexts. And again, they're not just Muslim, they're also adolescents. And what we know in general from the psychological developments that take place in adolescence is that you are then exploring with creating your own place in society. And in terms of that, both in relation to agency and in identity, uh, taking recourse to Islam, appropriating the Islamic heritage in your own way, can, again, uh, help to provide answers to existential and societal questions that these Muslim youth in the Netherlands have to deal with. So what I've done in this short lecture is show you how very often, while we look at religion during the BA Religious Studies, we do not take it for granted. We do not take religion to be the explanation 
of, uh, uh, of what we do, but we look at religion as something that needs to be explained. How, how come people have these practices? How come they attach these meanings to the religious heritage that they appropriate? Yeah. If that sparks your interest, you might be uh, interested in having a look at our website. And if you have more questions, you can email us. There's two email addresses here. Um, so I'm looking forward to getting your questions. But for the moment, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention.